24 year old Gina Allen and her brand new boyfriend, 28 year old Brandon Day, could not believe their luck. For the past 48 hours, they had been stranded in the rugged wilderness of the San Jacinto mountain range in California when they looked down into this ravine and they saw a campsite. There was a tarp that had been strung up between two trees. And so they ran over to it, hoping that the owner of this campsite would be in there and they could help them get out of these mountains. But when they got to the campsite, there wasn't anyone there. There. But from the looks of it, it looked like someone had been living in this site fairly recently. Underneath this makeshift roof from this tarp was a sleeping pad, there was a warm sweater, there was shoes, there was a disposable razor, some kitchen utensils, and there was a yellow backpack. Without any hesitation, Brandon and Gina, who were totally famished and they're exhausted and they're desperate, they just start rifling through the different things in camp, hoping to find some things that will help save their life, like a cell phone or a radio or even just a lighter or some matches or some food. And so Brandon focused on all the items that are just kind of laying out under the tarp and Gina focused on the contents of the yellow backpack. And so Gina, she opens up this backpack and she starts pulling out all these maps that are inside. And she notices on the margins of these maps in the white space, there is handwriting and it's done in pen and it looks like it's been written fairly recently. Now, at first, she didn't read any of the notes that were on these margins. She was just kind of pulling them out and stacking them on the ground next to her and continuing to rummage through this bag. But at some point out of the corner of her eye, she noticed on the top map that was sitting on the ground next to her, there was a particular note at the top of the page that as soon as she saw it, she stopped what she was doing, she turned and looked at it. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. And in fact, she didn't want to get her hopes up, but she slowly reached over, she picked the map up and she put it right in front of her face. And as soon as she was reading it, she just started laughing. She was so happy. She was so relieved. She yelled to Brandon to come over and look at this. And so Brandon stopped what he was doing. He turned around and he bent down and he looked exactly where she was looking. And when he read what she had read, he started laughing too. They were saved. There at the top of this map, there was a note that was dated the same date as the day they were there, May 8th. And so they knew whoever had written this had written it at least in the last couple of hours because it was May 8th. And so they had to be around here somewhere. And so Gina and Brandon, they stand up and they start yelling out for the owner of this camp to please come out and help them. But in their excitement, Brandon and Gina had overlooked a critical detail in this note. And it would turn out that critical detail would change their lives and the life of the man who owned this camp forever. Before Brandon and Gina ever began their doomed hike into the San Jacinto mountain range, another man, one which neither of them knew, was gearing up for a hike of his own that would take him through the San Jacinto mountain range. His name was John Donovan, and on April 19th, 2005, which was the day he would begin this journey, he was 59 years old. John had absolutely no family. He was born an only child, and by the time he was 10 years old, he had been orphaned and basically had to raise himself from that point on. Onward. By the time John was in his 20s, he had moved to Virginia, where he had taken a job as a social worker. And despite making a fairly decent salary, he refused to spend any more money than he absolutely had to. It was a habit he had developed as an orphan child trying to make ends meet with virtually no money whatsoever. And as an adult, that habit just never left him. So as a result, for his entire life, all the way up until he left for that hike in 2005, he never had anything nice. He basically wore the exact same outfit virtually every single day. He never owned a car, he never owned a phone, he never owned a computer. And when it came to where he chose to live, he would always live in the most absurdly cheap dwellings possible, which included at one point living in a partially burned down abandoned savings bank with no heat. John was a proud Irish Catholic. He drank lots of whiskey. He swore like a sailor and he had no problem speaking his mind no matter who he was talking to. While he he was a lovely person once you got to meet him, his unorthodox lifestyle and his at times gruff exterior made it pretty difficult for him to make friends for most of his life. 
but when he was in his 40s, he wanted to lose some weight, and so he decided to join a hiking club. And to his surprise, the other members of this hiking club adored him. They thought he was hysterical, and he made being out on the trail so much more fun and enjoyable. And before long, all these members of this club became John's family that he never had. And so John would go on every single trip this hiking club went on, no matter what. That was the most important thing to him in his life. When it came to hiking, though, John was a bit of an anomaly. Even though he would hike sometimes over 4,000 miles in any given year, he would still routinely get lost on trails he had been on dozens and dozens of times. But despite being totally self-aware of this fatal flaw in his hiking abilities, John rarely did anything to compensate for it. For example, he didn't bring with him on most hikes a compass, which would be the first thing you would think to bring with you to stay oriented. Also, because he refused to buy a phone, he didn't have that to aid him either if he ever got lost. In fact, John rarely brought much of anything on any hike he went on because John is what you would call a ultralight backpacker, which basically meant you would only pack the absolute bare essentials, and in John's case, sometimes less than the absolute bare essentials. And despite his friends trying repeatedly to get him to pack more equipment so he was more prepared, he would always say, no, he knows what he's doing and everything is good. And the truth is, John always did manage to get from point A to point B on all of his hikes, some of which included extremely difficult hikes, like the time he hiked the 500 mile long Colorado Trail, or the time he hiked the 2,175 mile long Appalachian Trail. Now, John would tell you that was all skill, but his friends would say, John was extremely lucky. He would get lost and then at the last second he would find the trail again, or he would lose some piece of critical equipment and then just someone on the trail would happen to walk by that had an extra set of whatever it was that John needed. And then one time when John was in Poland on a hike, he slipped on this icy embankment where earlier that day two other hikers had slipped and fallen to their deaths. And John has now slipped on this same embankment, he's careening down the sides, he's He's flailing, he can't stop himself, and then the drawstring on his pants gets caught up in a tree, and that arrests his fall and it saves his life. And so from that point on, John would only wear those pants when he went hiking, and he called them his lucky pants. In the spring of 2005, John and one of his very close hiking friends named Ken Baker, who was roughly his age, decided they were going to hike the 2,650 mile long Pacific Crest Trail. This trail spanned the entire west coast of the United United States. It starts in Southern California, right on the border of Mexico, and it goes all the way up to the very northern end of Washington State, right on the border of Canada. It takes the average hiker, if they're going to do this entire trail in one go, about five months, unless there's bad weather conditions that impede them along the way. John had been excitedly planning this epically long hike for the better part of the last year. He had actually typed out six pages on his typewriter of this itinerary that planned out every every single detail of this hike, down to how many ounces of coffee he would need at every stop along the way. John was especially excited about this particular hike because it was going to be the very first hike he would be doing after his retirement from being a social worker. And apparently John had huge plans for his retirement. He wanted to travel all over the United States. He wanted to go to Australia, to China, to Russia. He basically wanted to hike at least six months a year, every single year, until he was too old or too weak to continue to do so. But just a couple of days before John and Ken were supposed to fly out to California to begin the Pacific Crest Trail, Ken told John that he thought they should actually postpone the start of this trip by about three weeks. He said Southern California had experienced their snowiest winter in decades, and so it would make sense to wait a little bit of extra time to make sure all the snow had melted and that they didn't get caught in any sort of late snowstorm. Now, John was totally not having this. He had spent so much time thinking about this trip. He was so excited about it that he just couldn't wait any longer. And so he told Ken, I'm sorry, I'm going on the current timeline, whether I go alone or not. 
And so on April 19th, 2005, John made his way to his office where he was a social worker. His coworkers threw him a very small retirement party and he literally left the office, went straight to the airport and he flew to Southern California all alone. When he got there, he took a chance and reached out to one of his other hiking friends, a 48 year old tool salesman named Lynn Paget, and asked him, you know, hey, I know you live in the area. Would you be interested in coming on at least part of the Pacific Crest Trail with me? I'm gonna start here in the next couple of days. And John was extremely excited when Lynn said, you know what, sure, I'd love to come along with you. And the two of them made their way over to Campo, California, which is right on the border of Mexico. And they began their hike along the Pacific Crest Trail. But after going only about 100 miles, Lynn's feet started swelling so badly that he could not go any farther. And so from that point onward, John would be alone. The San Jacinto mountain range is the first major mountain range that the northbound Pacific Crest Trail hikers will encounter. And statistically, it's actually the most dangerous portion of the Pacific Crest Trail as 15% of all the fatalities that occur along this huge trail occur in the San Jacinto mountain range. It's a very steep mountain with a rapid rise in elevation from the desert floor all the way up to over 10,000 feet, which means in the summer, even when it's extremely hot down around the base of this mountain, it will probably be windy and snowing at the top. John reached the base of the San Jacinto Jacinto mountain range on May 2nd, and as he began his slow climb up, all of the hikers he was encountering were all talking about the same thing. There was apparently some big snowstorm that was due to hit the San Jacinto mountain range in the next couple of days, and so all of these hikers were actually evacuating the mountain to go to this little town to wait out the storm. Everyone's fear was they would get caught on Fuller Ridge when the storm hit. Fuller Ridge is towards the top of the San Jacinto mountain range, and it's probably the most dangerous part of the entire mountain range. It's basically this totally exposed, very steep section where if you lose your footing, there's nothing to stop you from tumbling down to your death. But when John heard this, he wasn't phased at all. He was not about to evacuate because of some storm. He was just gonna continue up this mountain, go over Fuller's Ridge, and carry on along the Pacific Crest Trail. And so for the rest of the day, he just continued up the mountain and eventually made camp about halfway up. He actually stopped near two other hikers that were also going to push through despite this storm. It was a 46 year old nurse from Canada named Connie Davis and her son, 20 year old Alex. And they were both very experienced high altitude climbers and they had all the right gear and they were very well prepared. And so that night after both parties had set up their camp, they struck up a friendly conversation during which John made some dismissive comments about Connie's parenting style that really agitated her, although it didn't seem like John really noticed he had upset her. And so needless to say, the next morning, Connie and her son had packed up and were long gone by the time John was waking up. So John just got up, he looked at the sky, it was still clear, although he did see some gray clouds rolling in, so he could sense that yes, a storm really is on the way, but he decided he was still just gonna continue on towards Fuller Ridge. So he put his backpack on and he began walking up the trail, and a little while later, when he was nearing Fuller Ridge, but was still several miles away, three very well-equipped hikers that he had not seen before came charging down the path towards him. And John stopped them and he said, hey, you know, how is it up there? What's the weather like? What's Fuller Ridge like? And they kind of looked at John and sized him up, looking up and down, and they saw that, you know, he's got light clothes on, he's got sneakers on, he doesn't have trekking poles. He just looks totally ill-prepared for what he's walking into. And they said to him, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for you to continue on here. This storm is gonna hit any time now, and we're not going to Fuller Ridge. We're actually turning around and leaving because of the storm and we have all the right gear. I mean, you should really consider turning around and leaving. But these three hikers would say there was just no way they were going to change John's mind. He was totally dead set on carrying on to Fuller Ridge. And so the three men that had told him not to go eventually just said, okay, you know, good luck. And they carried on down the trail and John continued up. But despite John's earlier confidence in his plan to go to Fuller Ridge and continue through San Jacinto Mountains, when the snow actually started to fall sometime in the mid-afternoon, John started to have doubts about his plans. There was already 
already a lot of snow on the ground where he was from previous snowstorms, and that was making it hard to see the trail as it was. And now with all this additional snow starting to dump down, he was worried it was gonna totally cover up the trail and he would lose it. And since he knew he kind of had a penchant for getting lost on trails, this was a real concern, but he was still very stubborn. And so despite these second thoughts, he just continued on along. And so after a while, he got to within maybe one or two miles of Fuller Ridge when he spotted up ahead of him two other hikers that seemed to be going in that direction. And so he ran up to them and he yelled for them to stop. And at this point, the snow is really starting to come down and the trail is completely wiped out and he can barely see in front of him. And these two hikers, they stop. And so he runs up to them. And when he gets up close, he can see it's actually Connie Davis and her son Alex from the night before. And so Connie is obviously not thrilled to see John again. But when he explained that he was having a really hard time staying on the trail and, you know, could he just tag along with them? Connie said, you know what? That's just fine. We're happy to have you. But she explained to him she was not going up to Fuller Ridge. Instead, she was taking a more circuitous route that would bypass the ridge. It would take a lot longer, but it would be safer given the weather conditions. John assured her that that was totally fine. He would just trail along with them. And then at some point he would break off on his own and he would go up to Fuller Ridge and they could go their separate way. And so Connie, her son and John begin walking along together. Now, Connie and Alex, they had crampons on their shoes, which are basically like metal cleats and allow you to very easily grip the snow and ice. They had trekking poles, they had all the right warm gear. And so they're easily moving along through these weather conditions. Meanwhile, John didn't have trekking poles or any high speed equipment. He did have crampons that he tried to put onto his shoes, but because he had sneakers that were not lined up to this type of crampon, they didn't really fit right. And so it caused him to constantly stumble and fall on the ground. And so that's how it went for a while until Connie and Alex reached this critical point. It was at this creek where they needed to go down and around, which would take them away from Fuller Ridge. And if John was going to continue like he said he would up to Fuller Ridge, that would be the point where he would break off from them and go up the mountain towards this ridge. And so Connie and Alex wait at the stream. They're turned around and they're looking back down the trail at John, who's fallen way behind at this point. And as they're looking at him, they're thinking this is going to take a long time for him to finally catch up to us. And so Connie, who really wasn't all that keen and hanging around John that much longer anyways, she figured, you know what? John has made his intentions completely clear. He said he is going up to Fuller Ridge. He is an adult. He is healthy. He can do whatever he wants. And so she yelled and waved to John and signaled that she and her son were going to go down this creek and this way to Fuller Ridge. So best of luck to you. And then Connie and Alex disappeared around the corner. Once John's hiking partners had gone, John got up to that creek and he was going to try to go up to Fuller Ridge. But by that point, the snow was practically blinding. And so at this point, John decided, you know what? I do need to turn around and go back down the mountain and evacuate to that town where everybody else had gone to to avoid the storm. And so John turns around and starts trying to backtrack along this trail back down the mountain but the trail is gone. The snow has completely whited it out and there's no other hikers anywhere nearby. And even if there were, he wouldn't be able to see them. And so for several hours, while it was still light out, John did his best to navigate down the mountain. And then when the sun went down, he really had no idea where he was. And so instead of trying to stay on this trail that at this point he really didn't think he was on, he looked out away from the mountain and way down below, he saw this big bright cluster of lights, even through through the falling snow, he could clearly see those were lights of a city. And so he decided he would use that as kind of like his North Star, and he would just continuously walk downhill towards those lights. And so for several hours, he just began walking towards these lights, narrowly avoiding huge drop-offs and climbing over boulders and avoiding trees and animals. And finally, he got to this very critical point in his journey down to these lights. He reached this area called Long Valley, where he had a decision to make. He could either continue down the mountain, which would require jumping down into this ravine that once he did, he would not be able to climb back out again. It was too steep. Or he could turn around and hike way back up the mountain and go some other direction. But at this point, he had really no idea what direction was the best direction. All he knew is he needed to go down the mountain because his situation was getting worse and worse by the second. If he didn't find shelter soon, he might get hypothermia and just die out here. And so he decided he would jump down into this ravine. 
And so he laid on his stomach, he lowered himself down over the edge, and he dropped down into the valley below. Once he stood up, he just continued walking down the mountain, and at some point he spotted a stream that he began to follow along. And as he followed this ravine, which was taking him straight down the mountain, he noticed the ravine walls, these huge walls on either side of him, seemed to get closer and closer to him, like this ravine was kind of coming to a point. And then after a while, he noticed up ahead, the stream just kind of disappeared. And so he walked a little bit farther, and then he came to an abrupt stop. The water had disappeared because it had flown off a 100-foot cliff that he was now standing in front of. He had come to the edge of this huge waterfall, and there was absolutely no way to lower himself down over it. It was an absolute fall to the death if he attempted to go down this waterfall. And so he looked to his left, and he looked to his right, and these huge canyon walls that had followed him all the way to this edge from when he dropped down, they were sheer cliffs. There was no way to climb those. And his initial drop into this ravine was unclimbable. He knew that going in. And so he was boxed in, he was trapped, and he likely knew that it would be at least a week or more before anybody figured out that he was even missing. And so totally disheartened, John left the edge of this cliff, this waterfall, and walked back up to a relatively flat area farther up the ravine, and he began to set up camp. He pulled out his green tarp, he put some line between two trees, he made a makeshift roof, he laid out his bed mat underneath, and then he climbed underneath the tarp and he settled in for a long night. The next morning when the sun came up, John attempted to make a fire, but none of the wood he was finding was dry enough, so all of his fires just kind of smoldered but didn't really catch. He had a mirror, a signal mirror, and he was prepared to flag down any aircraft that flew overhead, but no aircraft did, so he didn't flag anyone down. And so by the end of that night, he was back under his tarp, having made no progress, settling in for another freezing cold, sleepless night. The next morning, when the sun finally came up again, John was totally disheartened, and he decided to start jotting notes down on the margins of his map, which was the only place he had space to write. He figured he would keep a sort of diary, that way if he didn't get out of here, someone would figure out what happened to him. And so his first entry was that day. Day, May 5th, and he wrote that his friend Ken was right. He should have postponed this trip by three weeks and avoided the bad weather. Ken was the smart one. And also in this May 5th entry, he took an inventory of his food supply. He said he only had 12 cheese crackers left. And then on May 8th, John wrote a note that said, took a fall, too weak to climb out of Canyon, down is a gorge, no way out. This was the message that Gina and Brandon discovered when they stumbled on this campsite. But the significance of this note was not literally what he wrote, but rather when he wrote it. On May 6th, Brandon Day and his girlfriend, Gina Allen, were in Palm Springs for a business convention. Brandon was a financial advisor, and so he was out here for business, and Gina was his guest, so she was really just vacationing. And so towards the end of the convention, when Brandon had some free time, he and Gina decided to leave the hotel and go on a hike somewhere. And so they actually linked up with a tour group that was leaving the hotel that was heading over to this tram station where they were gonna take a tram car all the way up to the top of the San Jacinto mountain range. A tram car is basically like a ski lift, except once you ride it to the top of the mountain, you don't do any skiing, you just do sightseeing. And so Brandon and Gina, they get to this tram car, they hop inside, they get to the top, and it's totally amazing, beautiful view, there's snow at the top, and they're told they have about 20 or 30 minutes before their group is going to take the tram car back down again. And so Brandon and Gina decide to kind of venture off away from the main group and have some alone time before they leave again. And as they kind of venture off, they start to hear what sounds like a waterfall. And so the two of them are kind of looking around, asking if they can see it or if they know where it is, and they don't. And so they say, hey, do you want to just leave the trail and walk towards this waterfall? It can't be far. It sounds like it's only maybe a couple of minutes away. We'll take some pictures, we'll come back, and then we'll catch the tram back down again. And so they decide this is a great idea. They leave the path and they start walking towards the sound of this waterfall. But after walking for a pretty significant distance, they realize the sound of this waterfall is not getting any closer. It seems to actually just be getting far 
farther and farther away. And what they didn't know was happening was the sound of the waterfall was actually echoing off the walls of this mountain. It was basically playing a trick on them. The acoustics made it seem like it was really close, but really it wasn't, it was pretty far away. And so by the time they finally did locate this waterfall, they knew they had ventured fairly far off the main trail and they really needed to hustle to get back up to the tram station to meet their group and catch that last car out. And so they took a couple of pictures of this waterfall and then quickly turned around and began booking it back towards the station. But on their return trip, which they believed they were going in the right direction, they started hearing the sound of voices coming from the tram station, but they were coming from a different direction. And so Gina and Brandon stopped and they're thinking, you know, I think we got to go this way, but Clearly, that's the sound of the other people in our group coming from that direction. And so they decide to follow the sound of the voices. But just like the sound of the waterfall, the sound of the voices were not coming from that direction. That was just an echo bouncing off the walls. It was basically a trick the mountain was playing on Brandon and Gina. So they start walking in the wrong direction. And after walking for quite a while and not getting anywhere near the tram station, the voices just finally stop. And they look Look at their watches and they realize they missed the cutoff they missed the last tram all those tourists they were with they've left they are now alone somewhere out in the middle of the mountains but they did not panic they figured you know what we'll just make our way to the tram station and we'll either catch the next tram or you know maybe there's a payphone or something up there we can use and you know we'll figure it out now it's important to mention that brandon and gina did not expect to spend very much time out in the elements they expected to get on a tram, stay at the top of this tram station with a bunch of other tourists where there was a restaurant and a bar, and then they were gonna ride that tram car back down and be back at their hotel before dinner time. As such, they didn't bring any supplies. They didn't even have their cell phones. They had left those in the hotel room because they wanted to make sure they were focused on each other. And so all they had were the clothes on their back, which were very light. They had tank tops and some sweatpants on. They each had a very light jacket as well. And they had a wallet and some chapstick. They had no water, they had no food. And so Brandon and Gina, they begin walking around in search of this tram station. And for several hours, despite their best efforts, they don't find it. And then before long, the sun is going down and the temperature is dropping rapidly. And so eventually after it becomes too dark to continue to move around, the couple winds up going into a cave where they huddle up all night, barely avoiding becoming hypothermic. The next day, when the sun comes up, they haven't slept at all, they climb out of their cave, and they continue walking around the mountain in hopes they find this tram station. But eventually, they get to one of the higher points of the area they were in, and they have a pretty good vantage point around them, and when they start looking out, they don't see the tram station, they don't see anything but wilderness in all directions. And so they decided their best bet was just to walk straight down the mountain and try to just walk off the mountain. And they figured as they began walking down the mountain that the tour guide had probably recognized they were short two people the day before. And so certainly a search had been launched and there were people looking for them and probably they would be found long before they ever had to actually walk off this mountain. But little did they know, their tour guide that had brought them onto the tram and then brought that group down, they had recognized they were short two people, but they assumed those two people must have just taken an earlier tram and so nothing was reported. Nobody was looking for them. And so all day, Brandon and Gina made their way down this very steep mountain, falling half the time, smashing into rocks and trees and getting cut up on manzanita bushes. It was just this awful experience. And by the time the sun was going down, they had no sense of how close they were to the bottom. They didn't have a good viewpoint. They were just kind of trapped inside of the wilderness. And so once again, they huddled up for the entire night. This time they didn't have a cave to protect them from the wind. And so it was just another absolutely miserable night. And so finally the sun comes up on the third day and Brandon and Gina, they're up and they're moving straight down this hill. They wanna get out of there as soon as they can. And after smashing into more boulders and more trees and getting more banged up, they finally arrive at the same drop off down into a ravine in Long Valley that John had gotten to. And so they're standing over this ravine debating whether they should make the leap and jump down into this ravine, even though it means they can't climb out again. And so they're looking around, they're figuring, you know what, we don't really have a better choice. We don't really have the energy to climb all the way up and try to go a different way. And we don't even know if those ways are more advantageous. 
And so just like John, they turn around onto their stomachs, they grip the top of this drop off and then slip down into the ravine. Once they stand back up, they start walking down this ravine and they spot a river and they run over to the river and they drink as much water as they possibly can. And it's a huge morale booster. And then they get back up again and they're continuing walking down the stream when off in the distance, they notice a green tarp strung up between trees. It was John's campsite. And so Brandon and Gina, they run over to this campsite and they eventually come across John's notes on the margins of his maps. But after standing up and yelling out for this owner to please come out here and help us, we need your help, we're lost. And then no one came out of the woods, no one heard them, no one responded. Brandon went back to the note and he looked at it again and that's when he noticed it. The note had been written on May 8th. However, it had been written on May 8th, 2005. The year that Brandon and Gina were reading it was 2006. So this note was one year old. John had just happened to get lost and write a note on the exact same calendar day that Gina and Brandon arrived at his campsite and discovered the note. In their initial excitement and joy that they might get saved, they did not pick up on that year discrepancy. The couple began looking more closely at all of the gear underneath the tarp, and they noticed all of the metal objects, like the forks and spoons and the pots and the pans, they were all starting to rust. And some of the other objects, like the shoes, looked like they had been sitting in the same spot for a really long time. They both started to get a really bad feeling about this campsite, like something terrible had happened there. Gina emptied the yellow backpack's contents onto the ground, and that's when they found a wallet. They opened it up and they pulled out an ID card, and it was John Donovan's ID card. So now they knew who had written the note and who owned this camp. Afterwards, Gina and Brandon laid out all of the maps to see if there were other messages that they had not read yet. And there were, there were two other additional messages after the May 8th message. On May 11th, John said he was celebrating his 60th birthday and that unfortunately he was down to his last two cheese crackers. And then in his final message on May 14th, John wrote, headed down to Creek for water, goodbye, love you all. Devastated, the couple knew what they were reading were almost certainly John's last words and his body was most likely somewhere around here. And then it dawned on the couple that if John, who seemed like an experienced hiker who had all this gear, if he had gotten trapped and died out here, then how did they stand any chance with no experience and no equipment? And so not knowing what else to do, Gina just rounded up all of John's things. She stuffed them into his yellow backpack and then she shouldered the pack. And then she and Brandon just walked away from John's campsite and continued walking downhill hoping that up ahead there was not going to be some gorge like John had mentioned in his May 8th note. But unfortunately, after walking for a little while, they reached that cliff with the 100 foot drop with the waterfall going off the side of it. And they realized that they were trapped, same as John. There was nothing they could do. And so totally speechless and shocked, they just both sat down, they didn't look at each other, and they just sat there wondering what was gonna happen next. And they both were thinking, you know, this could be the place where I die. At some point, Gina kind of snapped out of her trance and she took John's backpack and she began rifling through it, pulling everything out all over again. And Brandon asked her, you know, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, maybe there's something in here that we missed. Maybe there's a secret pocket or, or something in here that could help us. And so she rifles through this bag and sure enough, she finds inside of a small pocket in the bottom of the bag was another bag, a little plastic bag, and inside of it were matches and they were still dry. And so immediately the couple pull them out and they start to round up logs to try to make a fire. And as soon as they light it, it doesn't catch because all the logs in the area that were on the ground were wet from previous snowstorms and rainstorms. And so all night they tried lighting these fires, but they all just kind of smoldered out. And so eventually after the sun went down, Gina and Brandon, who were totally disheartened, they went back up to John's campsite and they went under his tarp and they huddled together for another freezing cold night. The next morning, Brandon woke up because he actually did fall asleep and Gina was still sleeping. And so Brandon decided to just leave the tarp and go out and get a breath of fresh air. He knew they were in a terrible position, but he just wanted to clear his head. And so he stood up and he could barely stand. He was so achy and tired and he was so hungry and he decided he would just walk down to the edge of this cliff and look out into the valley to see if maybe there was a way down. And so he walked along the river, stopping periodically to get a sip of water until he got to the very edge 
village. And when he got there, he looked down and he saw something that he had not seen the day before. There in a pool of water all the way down, a hundred feet down, was a body lying face down in a pool of water. And that body belonged to John Donovan. Brandon was too far away to actually confirm if that really was John, but he instantly knew. But instead of being scared or saddened or depressed by the sight, it kind of invigorated Brandon and reminded him that if he doesn't act, he and Gina were going to die too. And so Brandon decided he wasn't gonna set some small campfire to try to signal someone. He was gonna try to light the entire forest on fire. And so he walked back up to the campsite and he got the matches out from the backpack and then he walked into the forest a ways that was right near the river and near their campsite and he found this tree that was obviously dead and he walked around gathering as much dry wood as he could and he propped it up against this dead tree and then he put as much kindling as he possibly could into this hole in the trunk of this dead tree and after doing all this prep work he got his matches out and he lit some of the kindling and to his surprise the tree caught on fire almost immediately in fact, it burned so quickly and so big that Brandon had to run away so that he didn't catch on fire. And before long, all these trees are catching on fire and he had to run all the way back to the campsite and wake Gina up. So he grabs Gina, they get up and they run all the way over to the edge of the waterfall and they turn and they're just watching half an acre just completely erupt in flames. And all this black smoke is billowing up into the sky. And then about an hour later, after the fire had eventually just kind of died out on its own, Gina and Brandon heard the distant rumblings of a helicopter. They had seen the smoke and they were coming to rescue them. Gina and Brandon would be airlifted out of the ravine and would make full recoveries. John Donovan's body would be recovered three weeks later. His cause of death could not be determined. Some say that final note he left on May 14th, where he said he was going down to the creek to get water and then said, goodbye, I love you all, that that was sort of a suicide note, that he actually threw himself off that cliff to end his suffering. Others say he just walked down to the edge of this waterfall and was trying to get a drink of water from the creek when he slipped and then fell over the edge to his death, but we'll never know for sure. What we do know for sure is that in 2005, when John Donovan was still alive and missing, had he been rescued, he would have left the valley with all of his supplies, including those matches, which would have meant in 2006, when Brandon and Gina found themselves in that ravine, there wouldn't have been a way to start that fire, and so they would have died. In fact, the helicopter pilot that did come up and rescue Brandon and Gina, he would say there was nobody planning to search that area. This was not an area they believed Brandon and Gina would be. And so it really was only because of that fire that those two lived. As such, the couple said they owe their lives entirely to John Donovan and his unbelievable sacrifice. On July 11th, 2006, a funeral was held for John in Virginia. 80 people showed up for it. Most of them were his hiking friends from his club. After the service was over, they all kind of poured out onto the cemetery lawn around John's gravesite. And as the bagpipes played Amazing Grace, Lynn Paget, the man who had done the first 100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail with John before his feet swelled up and he had to leave, he walked around the crowd handing out red Solo cups filled with a tiny bit of John's favorite whiskey. And then after making sure all of the adults had their drinks, Lynn went to the head of his very good friend's grave and he delivered a beautiful eulogy. In it, he tells the crowd that he thinks of John all the time, he misses him terribly, and at night he has the same dream. He's walking down this trail next to a stream and then the stream bends off to the side and as soon as he walks around the bend, he sees this green tarp. And he knows it's gonna be John. And so he yells, hey comrade, hey comrade. And as he's walking over to the tarp, he realizes John isn't there. All it is is a tarp, a pack, and some shoes on a rock. As for Brandon and Gina, they did stay a couple after the ordeal, but they would ultimately break up two years later. On September 12th, 1982, two off-duty Alaska police officers were off hunting in a very remote section of Alaska, about 20 miles away from Anchorage. The only way to get out to this area was by plane or by boat, and so generally speaking, the only people that came into this area were big-time hunters. After a long day, the two men realized it was starting to get dark and they were still deep in the woods and so they decided it was time to turn around and start heading back to camp. The journey through the woods was challenging and so the men walked down to the nearby Kinnick River
river and walked across an exposed sandbar. And as they walked, they noticed up ahead, there was a boot sticking out of the sand. And as they got closer, they realized it wasn't just a boot. There was also a human leg bone still in the boot. Being police officers, they knew the importance of not disturbing a potential crime scene. And so instead they marked on the map where they were, they left the area and they reported the body to their department. The following day, crime scene technicians came out to that remote area and they very carefully unearthed the remains, which still had women's clothing on them. And then afterwards, they began searching for evidence in the area. And eventually they discovered a single shell casing that was a 223 caliber round, which is a common caliber for hunting rifles. The remains were sent back to the lab for an autopsy and it was revealed this person was a female and she had most likely died at least six months earlier. And she had almost certainly been the victim of a homicide because because she had died from three gunshot wounds. Also during the autopsy, it was discovered that there were no bullet holes on any of her clothing. And so it appeared that she had been shot without her clothes on and then her killer presumably redressed her. Also, they found a hospital bandage wrapped up in her clothing that appeared to have been wrapped around her head, leading some to speculate that she had been blindfolded before she was shot. A couple of weeks after the autopsy, dental records came back and they identified the body as belonging to 23-year-old Sherry Morrow. Sherry was an exotic dancer from Anchorage who had been reported missing 10 months earlier. In her missing persons report, it was stated that the last thing she told her friends was she had been offered $300 to have pictures taken of her by a professional photographer. And she was going to meet this man right before she disappeared. While police were fairly certain that Sherry's killer was this so-called photographer, they they had no evidence that would allow them to search for this person. They had nothing. All they had was this shell casing that was commonly used amongst hunters. And there's lots of hunters in Alaska. So the police reported the finding of Sherry's body to the media in hopes that when they put that out to the world, that someone from the public would reach out with more information. During the police's press conference, one of the reporters asked them, you know, do you think Sherry's death is connected to the other unsolved deaths in that part of Alaska? What they were referencing was two years earlier, two other women's bodies had been discovered in that rough area where Sherry had been found. One of the women was so badly decomposed, there was no way to identify her. However, it was revealed she was probably in her late teens or early 20s. The other woman was able to be identified. It was 24-year-old Joanne Messina, who was an exotic dancer from Anchorage. But there was virtually no evidence at either of the two women's grave sites, and so their deaths remained a mystery. Publicly, at this press conference, the police told reporters that they did not believe Sherry's death was connected to those two other women. But privately, some officers had their suspicions. Not only had these three women met similar fates in a similar area, but over the past couple of years, there had been a significant increase in missing people out of Anchorage, Alaska. And most of these missing people were young women that were either exotic dancers or prostitutes. This convinced many officers that they were dealing with a serial killer, but there just wasn't any evidence to actually prove it, so they couldn't come out and say it publicly. Over the following year, no new information came out about Sherry Morrow or the other two deceased women that had been found in that same area. And so all three of their cases just continued continued to languish. Meanwhile, more and more exotic dancers and prostitutes were going missing out of Anchorage and no one knew why. Then on June 13th, 1983, the police got a break. Early that morning, a man driving a truck turned onto a quiet Anchorage highway. And as he was making his way down the road, he saw up ahead on the side, there was this woman running towards him, screaming with her hands over her head and she wasn't wearing pants or shoes. And so obviously he knew something was wrong. And so he pulled over. And as this woman is charging up towards him, he notices she has a handcuff on one of her wrists and she appears to be a lot younger than he initially thought. She's probably in her late teens. And so she comes running up to his car. He unlocks the passenger side door. She flings herself inside without even asking for permission. She slams the door behind her and then ducks down to keep her head out of the window like she's trying to hide from something out there. Now this man looked out and he didn't see anyone or anything, but he wasn't gonna wait around for whatever it was she was scared of. And so he just made a gut decision to take this girl away from here. And so he peeled off and drove down the road and the girl who was very shaken up couldn't even tell the guy what was going on she just asked him to please drop her off at a nearby motel and the man didn't ask any questions he drove her to the motel and he dropped her off the girl ran inside and up to her room and when she ran inside the motel receptionist sees this girl running in i mean she doesn't have her pants on she's got a handcuff on she looks terrified and so she called the police 
A few minutes later, the police showed up. They went up to this girl's room. They knocked on the door. The girl opened it up and she was obviously very scared and she allowed the police inside and she told them her name was Cindy Paulson and she was 17 years old. The police recognized this girl is terrified. She's not a threat. And so they removed the one handcuff that was still on her. And then they asked her, you know, what happened? And the police officers would say her story was just horrible. But what stood out to them was not how disturbing the story was. It was how composed and brave this girl was as she told it. This is her story. The night before, Cindy was working the streets of Anchorage. She was a prostitute and a car pulled up and inside was this wiry bearded guy with glasses who seemed kind of slight and harmless and he asked to buy her services. And because she didn't view him as a threat, she agreed and hopped in his passenger seat. And as soon as she sat down, he reached over and put a handcuff on one wrist and then drew a gun on her and told her to be quiet. And then he drove her to this fairly nice neighborhood, pulled into a driveway. He got her out of the car and led her into this house and he brought her along downstairs into the basement where as soon as she got down there, there was a dim light and she saw there was a chain swinging from the ceiling. And he strung her up onto that chain and for hours he assaulted her. And then after he grew tired of doing that, he told her he was gonna go take a nap and when he came back, they were gonna leave this house and go out to his cabin in the woods. At this point, she begged him to let her go, but he really didn't care. He just told her that if she made any noise or tried to escape at any point, he would have to kill her and then he walked out of the room. And for the next several hours, Cindy remained chained to the ceiling with half of her clothes off, wondering what horrible thing was gonna happen to her next. Eventually, her attacker came back in the room and he untied her from her chain and he walked her upstairs to his living room where he very proudly showed her a number of hunting trophies he had and he began telling her about how much he loved hunting and where he went hunting. And it was at this point that Cindy realized this guy has no intention of keeping her alive. He's shown her his face, his house, his car, he's told her about places he likes to go and things he likes to do. He's given her all this information about himself. She is a huge liability to him. And so it dawned on her that if she didn't find a way to escape, she was going to die. After the trophy tour, the man led Cindy back out to her car, he put her inside, and then he drove to a nearby small airport where he said his plane was. And so he pulled over to their hangar, he got her out of the car, and he put her inside of the plane. And as Cindy is sitting in the plane, she's watching this guy load gun after gun and bag after bag of what looks like military supplies into this plane. And so she knows that this is the moment. I have to escape right now because as soon as this plane takes off, I'm done for. And so at some point when this guy went over to his car to get something, and his back was turned to her, she jumped out of the cockpit of this plane, she fell to the ground, she got up and just began running out of the hangar. And she managed to get out of the hangar and began turning the corner and running towards this forest right as she hears this guy charging after her, screaming that he's gonna catch her and kill her. And so she just keeps running for her life all the way into this forest, all the way to that highway before she finally stopped and turned around and she saw the man had stopped following her. This is when she went onto the highway and she flagged down the guy in the truck who brought her to the motel. The police were shocked by her story. It sounded totally unbelievable, but she was so genuinely scared and so detailed that they believed her. And so they told her they would have to bring her to the hospital and on their way to the hospital, she demanded they go back to that airport that she had been held at so she can try to identify the hangar she had been in and hopefully the plane would still be in there. And so the police comply, they go into the airport and Cindy points out the hangar she believes she was in and when they get there, the plane she had been on was still there, but the man, her attacker, was not there. And so the police got out and they began taking down notes about the plane, its different tag numbers and what it looked like. And while they're standing there, the security guard from the airport came over because he saw the police cars and he told the officers that the night before he had seen the owner of the plane they're looking at acting very suspiciously with something inside of his car. And so on a hunch, he had recorded that man's license plate number and he gave that number to police. And so the police were able to use that license plate number and some of the numbers on the plane to figure out who owned both vehicles. And it was a local man named Robert Hansen who owned a very successful bakery downtown. After dropping Cindy off at the hospital, the police officers decided to pay a visit to Robert Hansen at his house. When they got there, Robert was actually pulling into his driveway right at the same time, and they saw his car matched the description that Cindy had given of his car. And then when Robert got out of his car, he matched the description that Cindy 
had given of her attacker. When Robert saw the police parked outside of his house, he immediately invited them over and said, you know, what can I help you with? And the police said, we'd like to talk to you. Can we go inside? Robert invited them inside. And when the police went into his house, it matched the description that Cindy had given of his house with all the hunting trophies everywhere. And so they sat down and they asked him what he was doing the night before. And he said he had spent the night with some friends and he had their contact information. And if you needed to talk to them, you could, but they would say he was with them. When the police asked if they could have a look around his property, Robert immediately consented and said, you can look anywhere you want. And so the police searched his property, but found no signs that Cindy had been attacked there. And so they thanked him for his hospitality and they left. Once they got back to their station, they checked in with Robert's two friends he claimed he was with the night before, and they each independently corroborated Robert's story saying that yes, he was with them from this time to this time. And so it appeared as unlikely as it seemed that Robert was telling the truth. And so the police went back to Cindy and they said, you know, are you sure that everything you told us is exactly as you remember it? You didn't exaggerate anything. You know, this is the truth. And Cindy said, absolutely. And they said, okay, well, are you prepared to take a lie detector test to prove that you're telling the truth? And Cindy said, no. Now it's unclear why she said no, maybe it was a general distrust of the police, but either way, when she said no, it immediately cast an enormous amount of doubt on her story in the eyes of the police. And when Cindy started to pick up that the police really didn't believe her anymore, she got spooked and just left town. And after that, her case and Robert Hansen were largely forgotten about. But three months later, on September 2nd, all of that changed. On that day, a construction crew was doing some work on a backcountry road not far from where those three women's bodies had been found. And at some point, one of their machines uncovered some human remains. The police were called in, who pulled up the rest of the remains. And then just like in Sherry Morrow's case, when they looked for evidence around this new body, they found a single shell casing from a 223 caliber round. The remains were brought back for an autopsy, where it was determined that the body was female and she had died from several gunshot wounds. Using dental records, they were able to identify this woman as being 17-year-old Paula Goulding, who was an exotic dancer who had gone missing five months prior from Anchorage. The police sent the 223 shell casing found in Paula's gravesite, along with the other 223 shell casing found in Sherry Morrow's gravesite, to a lab to be analyzed and it was quickly determined that both of these rounds had been fired from the same rifle. And therefore, both women had most likely been killed by the same person. This was the moment the police knew they were dealing with a serial killer, and many police officers wanted it to be Robert Hansen. He seemed like the guy, but he had a rock solid alibi and they had no hard evidence against him. And so without any other suspects, the police turned to a famous FBI profiler, a guy by the name of John Douglas, and they asked him to build a profile of who he think killed Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding. And when John's report came back, the police were shocked. The profile described a man in his 40s who blended in easily with society. He was well-liked and got along with people and was just a normal guy. And he was successful, probably because he owned a successful business. He was an avid outdoorsman and hunter, and he most likely had a significant speech defect, like a lisp or a stutter. The profile was perfectly describing Robert Hansen. And because of John Douglas's prolific success in correctly identifying killers based on his profiles, when a judge saw this particular profile and saw how neatly it lined up with Robert Hansen, he gave the FBI a search warrant for Robert's house. And this time they would find very damning evidence, like a map of the local area. It was a hunting map and on it, there were 37 X's marked off. And some of those X's coincided with the same area where those four women's bodies had been found. They also found a 223 caliber rifle along with a bag of women's jewelry that contained a necklace belonging to Sherry Morrow. As the FBI was carrying evidence out of Robert's house into their truck, a neighbor walked over after seeing all the commotion and she walked up to one of the agents and she was very skittish and anxious. And she said, you know, my husband, he's friends with Robert and he recently pretended to be an alibi for Robert. He had no idea how much trouble he was in. And I certainly didn't know but I want you guys to know that my husband was lying. He was not with Robert on the night that he said he was. This was the proverbial nail in the coffin for Robert Hansen, because now without this alibi, he had nothing to hide behind. And so when the police approached Robert with their overwhelming evidence against him between what they found in his house and this now recanted statement from his former alibi, Robert said, okay, I'm going to confess. But there was a catch. 
he was only willing to confess to murdering the four women whose bodies had already been found by police. Now, the police knew Robert had almost definitely killed more people, and so at this point, they just wanted to know who the other victims were and where they were. And so they offered Robert a deal where he would confess to those four murders and then give additional information about other victims, where they were located, who they were, what happened to them. In exchange, they would not prosecute him on any other victims he named. And so Robert agreed to these terms, he signed the deal, and then he gave a full, horrifying confession. He said he would drive around Anchorage at night and look for young, vulnerable women that were all alone. These were usually prostitutes out on the street, or they were exotic dancers he would try to befriend inside of clubs. And when he approached these women, he would tell them he was a professional photographer, and he thought they were beautiful, and he wanted to take photos of them, and he would pay them for the photo shoot. And many of these women were aspiring models, and they were really excited at this idea, and so they would agree to go. And so Robert would tell them to meet him the next day at a particular location, which was usually a fast food restaurant, and Robert would show up much earlier, and he would hide in his car, and he would wait to see when they showed up if they were alone or not. And when he saw they were alone and they had no one to help them, he would drive up and he would ask them to get in his car. What these women couldn't see was on the inside of the passenger side door was a handcuff that was already latched on to the door itself, and there was an open cuff waiting for them as soon as they got in. They would get in the car, he would reach over them and act like he was helping them put on their seatbelt. And then as they're kind of looking at him, wondering what he's doing, he would grab their wrist, throw it in the open handcuff, and then he would draw a pistol and hold it against their head and say, be quiet. During his confession, Robert bragged to police that he had done this so many times, putting the handcuff on and drawing the pistol, that it was like muscle memory for him. Once he had the women handcuffed inside of his car, he would drive them back to his house and he would bring them into his basement and he would chain them up to the ceiling, just like Cindy he had described. And then after assaulting them for hours, he would take them out of his basement, put them in his car, drive out to the airport. He would put them in his plane, but unlike Cindy, these women didn't escape. And he would take off and he would fly them out to his cabin, which was not far from where those four bodies had been found. Once he got the women into his cabin, he would undress them and put a blindfold on them. And then with their handcuffs still on, he would assist them out the front door and tell them to run. And they would, they would take off as fast as they could into the woods, running into trees, falling over, but just running for their lives, believing their ordeal was now over. They just had to get away from this guy. But what they didn't know is their ordeal was just starting. Robert had no intention of allowing them to escape. He knew there was deep water that surrounded his cabin. And so if they actually made it that far to the water's edge, they would drown. And so Robert would give these women a significant head start to give them the sense that they actually might escape. And then Robert would grab his knife and his hunting rifle and he would head out and begin stalking his prey. And for the next several hours or days, he would walk around the woods looking for these women and he would just stay off watching what they were doing. And at some point he would sneak up on them and he would wound them intentionally, usually with his knife. And then he had a blood trail to follow and he would follow these dying women who were screaming out for help. And at some point these women would know they were going to die. There was no hope for them and they would collapse or they would stop. And at that point, Robert would walk up to them and he would shoot them. Afterwards, he would remove their handcuffs, he would redress them, and then he would bury them in a shallow grave. Before he was carted off to prison to serve a life sentence without the possibility of parole, he was brought out by authorities to help identify where other grave sites were in that hunting area. But he was only able to find eight additional victims because he would go to different grave sites and the remains would not be there anymore, most likely because animals had ransacked the area, or he just simply forgot where it was, or he didn't want to share any more information with police. Robert never confirmed if all 37 of those X's on that map that was found are actual sites of victims that he buried. But investigators say that's exactly what they were. And in fact, many believe there are other maps with more X's on them. But the police could only confirm 17 victims. If there were more, we probably will never know. Because in 2014, Robert died in prison and he took those secrets to the grave.
In 2006, Heather Kwan was a 21-year-old college student living in the small residential town of Desert Hills in Arizona. From a very young age, Heather was someone who always seemed to give her friendship to the people who needed it the most. People who were hurting on the inside or who society had kind of forgotten about. This is why when she was a teenager and a young adult, she would often spend her weekends volunteering her time with underprivileged children. It's also why she aspired to go to law school and become a defense lawyer because she loved the idea of professionally helping people that desperately needed her help. She lived in a rental home with her boyfriend who was 18 years old, his name was Ryan Waller, and amongst other things, he was a huge gun enthusiast and a student. That year, the couple had made plans to visit Ryan's father, Don, on Christmas Day, so on December 25th. But when the day came and Don had made dinner for the couple and was expecting them, they didn't show up. And so Don tried contacting both of them, but when he couldn't, he just had a bad feeling that something was off. It was just very uncharacteristic of them to just no-show. But instead of driving over to their property himself, Don just called the local police and asked them to do a welfare check. The police arrived at the house in Desert Hills, Arizona. They knocked on the door, but there was no answer. They looked in the windows and some lights were on, but it was mostly dark inside. And they couldn't really tell from the car in the driveway if that belonged to the homeowners or somebody else. And so they stood there for a second, they're looking in the windows, there's no movement. They knock again while simultaneously calling out that, hey, we're the police, we're here to do a welfare check, just wanna make sure you guys are okay. And this time, after they were done knocking, they heard the deadbolt unlock and then the door swung inward into the house and standing right in front of them was Ryan. Ryan had this huge bruise on his left eye, this big black eye, and he had a cut on his nose and he was just standing there, not saying anything, not asking any questions, just looking at them. And they looked past Ryan into his house and they saw there was a woman lying on the couch, which they presumed was his girlfriend, Heather, because that was the two people they were coming to look for. And so they turned their attention back to Ryan and they asked him, you know, what happened to your eye? And Ryan was a little bit cagey. He didn't really give them a straight answer. He basically said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to my eye. And, you know, the police didn't really pry that much, but eventually they determined that Ryan was more or less okay, albeit a little bit strange. And then they said, okay, well, who's the woman who's lying on the couch? Is that Heather? And Ryan, again, was kind of cagey and a little bit dismissive and said something along the lines of, oh, you know, she's just sleeping. And so the police said to him, look, you know, we're here on a welfare check. Your father sent us here to check on you guys. And so we have to go in there and wake her up and make sure she's okay. And so Ryan, again, was just a little bit weird and kind of defensive and didn't really immediately comply, but eventually did step out of the way. And the police walked into the residence. They walked over to the couch. And as soon as they looked down at the girl on the couch, which was Heather, they saw right away that she was not asleep, she was dead. And she had been for at least a couple of days. She had died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Immediately, Ryan was arrested and brought out to a squad car. He didn't fight the arrest, but he did emphatically say he didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand what was happening. He didn't know what happened to Heather. He just seemed kind of generally confused. But regardless, he was thrown in the back of the police car outside the property, and he would sit there for several hours while more and more police and paramedics arrived to process the crime scene and also to transfer Heather's body Body to a morgue. Finally, around 5 a.m. on December 26th, the police brought Ryan, who was still in the back of this police car, to the Phoenix police station for questioning. The interrogation that followed, this hour-long interrogation that was all filmed, would start off relatively normally, but it would quickly devolve into this totally bizarre back and forth between Ryan and the detective who was questioning him. And then at the end of the interrogation, there would be this stunning revelation. From this point until the end of today's video, we're going to be showing you clips from the actual interrogation. When you get to the end of this video and you hear the revelation, and trust me, you will not miss it, I would encourage you to then go back and watch the clips of the interrogation or just go online and watch the entire interrogation because it's totally mind-blowing watching this thing knowing what's really going on. In the video, Ryan is led into this sort of nondescript small interrogation room room at 5.08 a.m. on December 26th. So he's just arrived at the station. They put him in this room. He's wearing this white jumpsuit that might have been issued by police. Maybe he owned it, but it definitely looks more like prison attire. He's got no shoes on, no socks on, and his hands are not cuffed. And so he walks into the room and he sits down in the chair that's in the back corner of the interrogation room. And this chair is right next to this table. And then on the other side of this table is another chair. And so Ryan sits down in the corner.
corner. He's kind of facing out towards the middle of the room. He's quiet. He's basically not moving. And then at some point he notices there is a handcuff that's connected to this table. Now, in some cases, the police would handcuff the person they were interviewing in this room. But in this case, Ryan was not told that he needed to put this handcuff on. He was uncuffed. So there was no directive that he needed to have this handcuff on. After handcuffing himself to this table, Ryan turns and puts his arms over this table and he lays down, puts his head in his arms, and he lays that way for about five minutes. Periodically, he makes a few groaning sounds, but for the most part, he's quiet. And then all of a sudden, as he's laying there, he suddenly makes a fairly loud moaning sound and he stands up in his chair like he's gonna walk out of the room. But as soon as he starts to walk away, the handcuff stops him, the handcuff that he was not told to put on. And so he's stuck against this table, but he doesn't seem phased by it. He looks almost confused by what's happening, but he doesn't dwell on it for very long. Instead, he just reaches across the table and grabs a blank piece of paper. And then he just sits back down in the seat, he crosses his legs and he starts looking at this piece of paper. At 5.17 AM, so roughly nine minutes into this interrogation, which really hasn't even started yet, Ryan is intently looking at this blank piece of paper when a detective walks into the interrogation room. This detective was named Dalton and he informs Ryan that they're going to be taking pictures of his feet and so he needs to put his feet up on the table that's right next to him. Ryan at first acts very confused and doesn't really understand what's happening but he eventually complies and he puts his feet up on the table and by the time his feet are up there another officer walks into the interrogation room and he's got a camera and he's got this big kit with him and he would begin about a 10 minute long process of photographing Ryan's feet and also swabbing Ryan's feet. During this 10 minute session Dalton stays in the room and so Ryan periodically asks him if he can just leave and go home, seemingly unaware of how serious the situation really was for him. And when Dalton would tell him, no, you can't leave, Ryan would act totally frustrated and kind of angry and upset, kind of like how a child would act if they were told they couldn't have something they really wanted to. At 5.28 a.m., after this 10-minute session is complete and they've photographed and swabbed Ryan's feet, the second officer leaves the room and Dalton shuts the door behind him and then he walks over to the table and he grabs the chair on the other side from Ryan. He drags it out so it's closer to Ryan and then he sits down and introduces himself. After that, he begins asking Ryan some very basic questions. He asks him to confirm his name, which he does. He asks him to confirm his date of birth and his social security number and Ryan does both those things. And then he asks Ryan if he understands why he was there, why he was being interrogated. And Ryan says, no. And so at this point, Dalton says, okay, you know, let's just stop right now. I'm gonna read you your rights. And so it's at this point in the interrogation that Ryan's behavior starts to get really, really weird. After Dalton tells Ryan he needs to read him his rights, you can see Ryan doesn't compute what he's saying. He's just kind of looking blankly and Dalton seems to pick up on that. And so he tries to make it kind of lighthearted. And he says, you know, hey Ryan, I'm gonna read you your rights like they do on TV, you know, like on Cops and on Law and Order and CSI and those crime shows, they read people their rights. That's what I'm gonna do. You know what I'm talking about? And Ryan just goes, no. And Dalton's kind of confused. He's like, you haven't seen any cop show where they read people their rights? And at this, Ryan kind of changes his behavior. And suddenly he's not as robotic. He's a little bit defensive looking. And he says, oh, yeah, I have, yeah. At this, it's pretty obvious to Dalton that Ryan is lying about something that is totally insignificant, whether or not he's seen true crime TV shows. It really just didn't matter at all. And there's this weird hesitation where both of them are just kind of being quiet for a minute. It's like Dalton knows he's lying about it and Ryan just seems totally confused. And then ultimately Dalton just decides to not key in on this kind of weird lie that Ryan has just told. Instead, he just reads Ryan his rights. And then after that, he gets back into some basic questions. The next one was, hey Ryan, what was the highest grade you achieved achieved in school. And now at this point, Ryan is not looking at Dalton. He's looking to the far side of the room. He's got this blank expression on. And when he's asked this question, he just says, I don't know. And Dalton's like, you don't know what level grade you achieved in school. And Ryan says, no, I don't know. Uh, eighth, eighth grade. 
So again, he's changed his answer fairly abruptly when he's challenged, and so Dalton is probably thinking to himself that he's lying again. But again, it's just kind of an insignificant thing, but it's building a pattern of mistrust here. It's hard for Dalton to believe that Ryan is going to be truthful if he can't even tell the truth about things that don't matter. But Dalton decides not to fixate on it. Instead, he asks a follow-up question based on the fact that Ryan has said eighth grade is the highest level he achieved. And so Dalton says, okay, well, did you get your GED? A GED is a high school diploma equivalent, and it's something you would get if you did not graduate high school. And since eighth grade is below high school, then Ryan clearly did not finish high school. And so it's a natural question to ask. The answer to this question is binary. You have a GED, you don't have a GED. But Ryan's answer is anything but binary. It's totally contradictory and weird, and it really begins to show a side of Ryan that just doesn't add up. He's acting totally weird. Did you, do you have a GED? I don't know. You don't uh, know what? I don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. So what? What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, as in letter grade. I'm asking, did you graduate high school? No. And the highest you went was eighth grade? Mm hmm Yep. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. After the discussion about Ryan's education goes nowhere, Dalton again does not fixate on all the issues with his answers so far, and instead just kind of continues asking more questions. And so he begins to address Heather. He starts by asking Ryan if he has a girlfriend. Now, Dalton at this point would know that Heather, the girl who was deceased, was Ryan's girlfriend because the police were asked to do the initial welfare check on Ryan and Heather, the couple. That's something that Dawn would have relayed to police. And so Dalton knows they have a relationship Relationship, but he wants Ryan to tell him he has a relationship with Heather. So again, he asks Ryan, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And Ryan says, no, which is a lie. But Dalton goes along with it and says, okay, well, do you know a girl named Heather? And Ryan would say, yes, I do. But his description of Heather was just completely inaccurate. He said Heather was a 16 or 17 year old girl, even though she was actually 21. And he would say her last name was Kaiman. He thought, he wasn't entirely sure. He said she has nicknames and she has different names she uses but he believes it's Kaiman, even though her last name was actually Quan. Now, Dalton, of course, is aware of these discrepancies, but again, he does not fixate on them. He just keeps on asking more questions. Dalton asks Ryan, what happened to your face? You have this huge bruise on the left side of your face. You know, what happened? At first, Ryan says he doesn't know. But when Dalton pressed him and kept asking more and more questions about his face and how it happened, Ryan eventually would begin to open up. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? Um, I don't know. I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? I don't know. It was an accident. I forgot why. Like the other police officers involved, Dalton believed already going into this interrogation that Ryan killed Heather, that the bruise on his face was from Heather fighting back before ultimately Ryan killed her. And so for Ryan to say, the mark on my face is from Heather, even though he claimed it was an accident, to Dalton, that was the same thing as Ryan saying, I killed Heather. Dalton attempted to get more specific details about the actual physical struggle that took place between Ryan and Heather, but as he asked more and more questions, he became more and more aggressive and it seemed like Ryan picked up on it and became very defensive and started throwing out random pieces of information, much of which seemed untrue. Like he suggested there was at 
at least two or three other people that were in the house on the night that Heather got killed, but it's unclear if these people were real or if they were actually ever there. And it just seemed like Ryan was kind of panicking and just kind of saying all sorts of random things. And so at some point, Dalton just wants to focus the conversation because he feels like it's getting totally out of hand. And so he just stops Ryan and he says, Ryan, there is a dead girl in your house and I need information. Hey, Ryan. Huh? Huh? There's what? a dead girl in your living room. She's dead? Yes. Heather? I don't know. I want to know what happened in your house last night. The girl on the couch is dead? I don't know. If she's on the couch, she's dead. The interesting thing about Ryan's reaction to being told by Dalton for the first time in the interrogation that there was a dead girl in his house is Ryan reacted with genuine surprise. It's the only time in the entire interrogation start to finish where Ryan sits forward in his chair, he kind of perks up and he seems relatively normal. He's not acting confused and kind of bizarre. It's like he's really dialed in as if he had not heard this before, that he didn't know Heather was dead, and he's now for the first time being told, and it shocked his system. But just seconds after he sits forward and seems really engaged, he goes back to kind of being totally bizarre, and he also suddenly had this really elaborate story about what happened to Heather, even though just seconds ago, it seemed like he had just learned about it. So it didn't really make any sense that he would have a story so readily available for something he seemed to not know anything about. And of course, like all of his other answers, his story he gave was full of contradictions and holes and was just totally unbelievable. Well, these people came over, Richie and his dad, with shooting arrow bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. They hit you and... they hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you, not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? Mm-hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They had revolvers. They have revolvers? Yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. Following this exchange, Ryan would change his story again and would say, actually, they didn't shoot me, they just shot Heather, they put me in a sleeper hold. But when Dalton asked him, what do you mean sleeper hold? Ryan said, oh, I don't know what a sleeper hold is. And then eventually, Ryan would actually just ditch the sleeper hold narrative and go back to the Richie and his father. They came in and they shot both of us. At this point, Ryan's story has become so convoluted and it's changed so many times that it's just totally unbelievable. And so Dalton who was doing his best to kind of go along with Ryan's story, at this point just can't even pretend anymore. He cannot pretend that he's following the story. It doesn't make any sense. You're telling me, you're, you're all over the board here, number one. You're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing, and they, you're saying they shot you in the eye. Okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yes. And that's Is it, it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a if revolver. They shot you in the eye with a revolver. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. How do you know? It was most likely you'd be dead. That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. So you got shot first? Uh huh. And what happened? Did you fall to the ground? Yeah, I was trying to get up and I couldn't. I don't okay. know. And then she got shot? Mm hmm. What, why, what, what did you do? Nothing. Did you call 911? Uh -uh. Did you see if she was alive? She was sleeping still and that's it. I just let her sleep. She got shot in the side of the face and you let her sleep? Yes. This does not make sense, Ryan. 
After this exchange, Dalton just goes full bad cop on Ryan, openly accusing him of shooting and killing Heather. And Ryan just continues to say he doesn't know anything, that he didn't do it. And his answers are just totally nonsensical and contradictory and nothing is making sense. And so finally at 5.52 AM, roughly 45 minutes into this interrogation, Dalton is just at a loss. He does not know how to handle Ryan because even though he really believes he did it, nothing Ryan has said has incriminated him because Nothing Ryan has said makes any sense. And so he's sitting there kind of thinking what he's gonna do next. And then Dalton notices something. He notices something on Ryan's face. He tells Ryan to come closer. He needs to look at it. Let me see your nose. Put your, put your, legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring your face closer. Okay. Put your legs down. Oh, my head hurts. What Dalton had finally just discovered were four bullet holes in Ryan's face and head. Ryan had committed no crime. He was a victim the same way Heather was a victim, but somehow Ryan had survived the attack. On December 23rd, so two days before the welfare check, two men attempted to break into Ryan and Heather's house. They were 23-year-old Richie Carver and his 54-year-old father, Larry Carver, the same Richie and Richie's father that Ryan had mentioned during the interrogation. They were there because of an altercation that had occurred between Richie and the couple about a month earlier. During that time, Richie was actually living with Ryan and Heather, but apparently he began hitting on Heather and Heather told Ryan and Ryan got really mad about it and Ryan and Richie got in this big fight and ultimately Ryan kicks Richie out of the house. Now this totally infuriates Richie and is very embarrassing for Richie. And so right away he begins plotting his revenge. And so on December 23rd, Richie and his father, they were there to carry out this revenge plot. When the father and son got to the back of Ryan and Heather's house, Ryan saw them at the back door through the glass door that was near their kitchen. And he ran over to try to stop them from getting inside. But Richie and Larry managed to barely get open the door and Richie reached in with his hand, which was carrying a gun and he shot Ryan point blank twice in the face. The first bullet went in through his nose and then out the other side of his nose. So that's the first two bullet holes. And then that bullet traveled back into his head through his left eye into his brain where it got lodged. And along with the bullet, six pieces of his skull that broke off from this bullet went inside of his brain as well. So that's the first three bullet holes. And then the second bullet that was fired into Ryan's head hit the side of his head. It did not penetrate into his skull. So the bullet didn't lodge anywhere inside of his brain. However, it did break off a piece of his skull. And so that was the fourth bullet hole. Ryan dropped to the ground. He was unconscious. They assumed he was dead. They managed to force the door the rest of the way open. They stepped inside. They stepped over Ryan's body and they walked into the living room where Heather was cowering on the sofa and Richie just immediately walked up, put a gun to her head and fired a single shot. After she had fallen to the ground, the two men stole some things in the house and then fled the scene. They would ultimately get caught and they're both currently serving life sentences. It's believed Heather died instantly from her gunshot wound, but Ryan didn't. At some point, maybe a couple of hours after he was shot, he woke up, but he had severe brain damage and he wouldn't have known what was going on. He didn't really know what happened. And he saw his girlfriend, Heather, lying on the couch, but he thought she was just sleeping. And so he too went to his bedroom and he fell asleep. But the next morning he woke up and he still would have had no idea what was going on. And he spent the day on the 24th, just kind of wandering around his house with his girlfriend lying dead on the couch. And so after a full day of just kind of mindlessly walking around his house, he went back to bed and then he got up on Christmas day on the 25th and spent another day just kind of walking about his house with his girlfriend who he believed was sleeping, but really she was dead. And so finally the welfare check is called in, the police show up, and as soon as they see Ryan, they jumped to conclusions that he must have killed Heather. And it kind of dictated the way they treated him. Had they believed he was a victim, they might have sought medical attention for the wound on his face, but again, jumping to conclusions and assuming he was the killer, they figured that bruise on his face was from the woman fighting back. She had struck him before he, 
had savagely killed her. And so they didn't give him any medical care. Instead, they put him out in the cop car out front of the property, and he sat there with no medical intervention for six hours. And during those six hours, literally every second that went by, there was irreversible brain damage being caused because he had all this bleeding inside of his head that was causing brain damage. And so the clock was ticking as soon as they found him, and for hours and hours and hours, he got no care and was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so finally, he goes to the police station and again they do not give him any medical care instead they interrogate him for almost two hours even though he has four bullet holes on his face that apparently no one noticed or no one took seriously but regardless he spent those almost two more hours in the interrogation room where every second that's going by his brain is getting more and more destroyed irreparably destroyed and then finally at the end of the interrogation Dalton who's probably thinking to himself what is wrong wrong with this guy. His answers don't make any sense. He's all over the place. And that's when he stepped back from looking for a way to convict this guy and noticed the holes on his face, specifically the hole in his nose. And that's when he called him forward and he looked at his face and he realized a huge mistake had been made and he called an ambulance. Here is a clip of the fire department who arrived ahead of the ambulance in the interrogation room learning about what's happened to Ryan as they wait for the ambulance. Guys. Hey guys. Captain, you're not going to believe this one. I can't believe it either. You're right. I've already heard the story. I can't believe it. Uh, this is just my observations that this might be an entrance, this might be an exit, this might be into his eye. And he's acting uh, like he has a serious head injury, which would make sense. Ryan was ultimately rushed to the hospital where he would undergo emergency surgery that would save his life, but it would come at a great cost. They not only had to remove a large portion of his brain, but they also had to remove both of his eyes. Now, it should be noted that at least one other source says he only had his left eye removed, but regardless, after the surgery, Ryan was no longer independent. He had so much brain damage, he couldn't take care of himself, and so he had to move back in with his parents, who became his full-time caretakers. And then 10 years later, Ryan would die from a seizure that was directly connected to the injuries he sustained from that attack and it's connected to the lack of care he received in those first critical eight hours after the police found him. The Phoenix Police Department, after this mishandling of Brian's case went public, they did an internal investigation, but no one was ever disciplined, at least not publicly. As for Ryan's family, they certainly could have filed a lawsuit against the Phoenix Police Department, but they chose not to. They said, the only thing we want is our son back, and a lawsuit will not give us that. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the like button a sandwich of their choosing. But when you make it, make sure you construct it between two very thin, stale rye bread heels. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly two or three video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannels and hats and sweatshirts and mugs and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballen.com. If you want to learn about upcoming deals and promotions in our shop, 
shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. The username is shop Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. We also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where we post random short videos and lost episodes. We also have a Facebook page just called Mr. Ballin where we post condensed versions of the long episodes you see on YouTube. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description.